myself. Um, I'm Debbie Ivazas. I work for the city of Redwood City. I manage the water conservation programs here. And our landscape class tonight is one of our public education programs offered through Bosco. Um, been at the city quite a long time. For those of you who live in Redwood City, some of you may have spoke to me in the past. Hopefully not about a high water bill. All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Tonight our topic is native plants and our instructor is Juanita Salisbury. And hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Um, I'll go ahead and let her introduce herself. And I will go through these slides. And let me know in the chat if there's any issues, any problems. So let me see if I can get to this. Okay, so all of you are muted. Um, the instructor will pause periodically and I should uh, ask if that is if that is your plan, Juanita, if that's how you would prefer to move forward is to pause every once in a while or? That's good, yeah. Okay. And then audience questions will be encouraged. Um, raise your hand and the moderator, which is me, will unmute you to ask questions or I'll ask the questions. I'll read the questions for the instructor. Um, typically in the past, well, I remember last time you would prefer them to type out the questions. Is that right? Or you'll take them. Yeah, yeah, that's helpful. But if, if people want to um, just don't want to type and just like ask a question. Okay. That's All right. Just let me know when you want to take questions. Um, the webinar is being recorded and will be available um, later on. So, oh, there's your raise your hand and your questions and answers. And about Bosca, we represent, Bosca represents 26 agencies, which includes cities and water districts, a water company, a university, Stanford, um, that purchase wholesale water from San Francisco Regional Water System. The Bosca member agencies provide, excuse me, water to 1.8 million people and over 40,000 businesses and community organizations in Alameda, Santa Clara, and San Mateo counties. Bosca's goal is high quality supply of water at a fair price. So, um, in general, we've been doing indoor conservation for many years, and for the most part, we're pretty efficient, especially since we've got plumbing codes in place now that uh, don't allow for water wasting plumbing fixtures to be installed. So outdoor water use represents the single largest untapped opportunity for water conservation in our service area. So outdoor water use reduction throughout through the use of water efficient plants and innovative techniques can conserve water, ensure that the future water supply needs of our community are met. So we do that by helping you out. Um, we have a Lawn Be Gone program. So if some of you might get some ideas for your Lawn Be Gone project this evening, um, we pay you a depending upon the water agency, a dollar to $4 per square foot to take that um, thirsty lawn out and replace it with some beautiful um, water efficient plant material. And then you'll also uh, replace your spray irrigation with drip irrigation. And it's amazing um, how much water you can save by doing that. And then we have a rebate program for rain barrels. It's in coordination with the San Mateo County Water Pollution Prevention Program. Um, even if your water agency doesn't participate, if you live in San Mateo County, you can get a rebate for it, but many of the water agencies also um, rebate for it. So that's $100, up to $200 for cisterns. Um, so anyways, take advantage of that. Smart controller rebate and installation program. Redwood City only offers the rebate. Some agencies do offer um, an installation as well. Um, and that is a really great program. The controller, watch out for specials. They're always offering some specials. So sometimes you get a controller for, I don't know, $30, $40. It's just amazing. Um, and then you have an optional rain garden rebate as well. 
And then uh, for Valley Water customers, they also have a um, sustainable landscapes program. You can get up to $2 a square foot. There's some information there. And then there's other water, other resources, the South Bay Garden, Green Garden, Green Gardens. Sorry, I was going to say Green Gardeners. Um, so I would visit the Valley Water website and see all that they have to offer if any of you are customers of Valley Water. And I think that's about it. And then there's more uh, classes coming up. You have a hands-on workshop for sustainable landscape, rain gardens made easy, drip irrigation, um, designing rainwater catchment systems in the landscape, healthy soils. That'll be hosted by Redwood City as well. Tree Maintenance 101, Pollinator Plants, Walk and Talk. And then we also have uh, WaterWise Gardening in the Bay Area uh, website that is hosted on the Bosco website as well. And I'm going to stop sharing, but I would also encourage those of you that are Redwood City residents to um, sign in to or register for drop counter. So we have mostly AMI meters or smart meters throughout the city, and you can go in and view your hourly consumption, which is really helpful, especially if you're trying to save water outdoors. So with that, I'll hand it over to Anita. Thanks, Debbie, and uh, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Juanita Salisbury. I'm a licensed landscape architect here in California. Um, and uh, I do a lot of these native plant public gardens here in Palo Alto, where we're located. And if you're interested in looking at some of our gardens um, and knowing more, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at the Primrose Way Pollinator Garden and YouTube, Primrose Way. I also have a website. PrimroseWayPollinatorGarden.com. And as I mentioned before, um, I do take care of several uh, pollinator gardens here in Palo Alto, where I live. Um, if you come in on Embarcadero Road here, this map off to the right here, um, the first garden is the Primrose Way Garden, thus the name. Um, along Embarcadero, there's the Gwenda Street Garden. Up Newell Road, there's the Hopkins Avenue Garden, Arcadia Place, Island Drive, up the West Greenwich Garden, um, and then the Churchill Street Pollinator Garden. And we are connecting these habitats uh, via a uh, corridor. And I just would suggest um, if you wanted to check those out, um, just uh, they're always open, so it's a good place to go and see what the plants look like during the year because some of them lose their leaves, bloom times vary, lots of different uh, forms, colors, textures, and fragrances to see over the course of a year. <clears throat> so tonight we are going to talk about thriving native gardens and we have a strategy tonight with our native plants. We're going to talk about our Keystone and Pioneer Strategy, which maximizes success, biodiversity, and enhances water savings. We're gonna talk about um, understanding what Keystone and Pioneer species are and discover the unique roles these plants play in building a resilient ecosystem. We're going to talk about some plant selection strategies, learn how to choose the right native plants for your space and goals essential functions of native plants, explore how these plants provide critical food and habitat for local wildlife, some best practices for native gardening, so you gain some practical tips for establishing and maintaining a thriving water efficient garden. And then we'll close by talking about creating a dynamic landscape where you can embrace the ever-changing beauty of your native garden as it evolves over time. So firstly, let's talk about the uh, Keystone and Pioneer Partnership. What are Keystone species? Keystone species are the backbone of a mature ecosystem providing essential resources and supporting a wide range of wildlife. Pioneer species, 
are the trailblazers, rapidly colonizing disturbed areas and creating conditions for other plants to thrive. And working together, pioneer species prepare the stage while keystone species ensure the long-term stability and biodiversity. And if you take a balanced approach by incorporating both types of plants in your garden, uh, it leads to a more resilient and sustainable ecosystem. So let's talk first about some pioneer plant species, nature's trailblazers. And here we have a picture on the right of uh, part of the Primrose Way garden, these poppies. Every spring they put on a real show. There's a few other things in there, but it's, it's really a, a big display of poppies every year. But the key function of these pioneer plant species, um, and there are quite a few, uh, soil stabilization and erosion control. They do nutrient enrichment. They uh, fix nitrogen um, by legumes. They attract pollinators and beneficial insects. They provide early stage food and habitat for wildlife. And they create favorable microclimates like shade and wind protection for other plants. And the benefits for your garden is that you can jumpstart your ecosystem development. You can improve soil health and fertility, reduce weed pressure, attract wildlife and increase biodiversity, and facilitate the establishment of keystone species. An example, let's talk about those poppies. <clears throat> California state flower, but they are the first to colonize disturbed or barren areas. They are hardy and can thrive in harsh conditions such as poor soil and limited water. And California poppies possess the following characteristics, drought tolerance. They are adapted to the dry Mediterranean climate of California, rapid growth, they can establish themselves in open, in open areas very quickly. Prolific seed production. Their seeds can also remain dormant for years and then germinate when conditions are favorable. And by colonizing disturbed areas, California poppies help stabilize the soil, prevent erosion, and create conditions that are more suitable for other plants to grow. They play an important role in the process of ecological succession, which is the gradual change in species composition in a community over time. So more pioneer plant uh, species examples. Um, over here on the left, we have lupins. And these vibrant flowering plants with their tall spikes of colorful blooms are well known for their ability to thrive in disturbed areas and they improve the soil quality by fixing nitrogen. I'll talk about what that means in just a second. Coyote brush, and this is actually on the corridor itself, and this is a nice, uh, a nice form of coyote brush. Scientific name, Baccarus pilularis. And this evergreen shrub is a common site in coastal scrub and chaparral communities. It's highly adaptable and can colonize areas after disturbances like fires, or landslides, and this is actually um, a variety called Twin Peaks. It can stay very low and tight against the ground and just forms a really nice, kind of like a nicely textured green rug. So one of my favorite plants to use um, in the corridor project, which is about a quarter mile long, I want to plant things that literally I can plant them and ignore them. And th these plants are, they fit the bill perfectly. Another pioneer plant species is the buckwheats or the areogonum species. These diverse plants ranging from low growing ground covers to tall shrubs are often found in arid and rocky landscapes. They're excellent at stabilizing soil and providing food for and shelter for pollinators. And here we have a vast expanse of the coast, coastal buckwheat, the areogonum latifolium. This is one of my favorite plants to use uh, because they are extremely drought tolerant. Um, there are places where I have them where I do not water them and they, they do just fine. So let's talk about nitrogen. Uh, when we talk about fixing nitrogen, what does that mean? 
Well, fixing nitrogen is a process whereby certain plants and bacteria uh, take in nitrogen from the air. There's a lot of nitrogen floating around in the atmosphere and they convert it into a form that enriches the soil. And this essential nutrient then becomes available to other plants in the ecosystem, promoting the overall biodiversity and ecological health. And nitrogen just doesn't help plants grow. It's the crucial component of chlorophyll, the green pigment that allows plants to capture sunlight and turn it into energy. So those nitrogen fixing plants, if you really wanna jumpstart your garden, those are the plants that, that will do that for you. And so without nitrogen, the magic of photosynthesis wouldn't be possible and plants could not capture the sun's energy. So how do you identify what is a pioneer plant species? And over here I have on the right, a picture of the northern tip of the Point Reyes seashore. It's basically a sand dune. And in that sand dune are growing poppies, lupins, and baccarus, the big three. And they're enabling this plant in the middle to grow. This is our, one of our native thistles, beautiful cobweb thistle growing there. So, but in identifying which species are um, pioneer plant species, consider several key characteristics and research their ecological role. So one, habitat preference. Pioneer species often thrive in harsh conditions like sand dunes, um, disturbed soils, rocky areas, recently burned landscapes. They are adapted to low nutrient levels, drought and intense sunlight. They have interesting seed dispersal mechanisms. So they gotta get to those places. Um, and there are different ways that they do that. They have very effective seed dispersal mechanisms, such as windborne seeds, seeds that attach to animals or seeds that remain dormant for long periods until conditions are favorable for germination. They exhibit rapid growth and reproduction Pioneer species often exhibit rapid growth and early reproduction, allowing them to quickly establish themselves in open areas and outcompete other plants. They do soil stabilization and improvement. Many pioneer species play a vital role in improving soil conditions by adding organic matter, fixing nitrogen, or preventing erosion. And they facilitate that succession. They pave the way for the establishment of other plant communities by creating shade, modifying soil conditions, and attracting pollinators and other seed dispersers. All right. Okay, so the flip side here is that we have keystone species to include in our toolkit. So what is a keystone species exactly? A keystone species plays a pivotal role in an ecosystem supporting a disproportionately large number of other species. Without it, the entire ecosystem would be dramatically different or even cease to exist. These species have what we call low functional redundancy, meaning that no other species can fully replace their ecological niche. And so the more species a plant supports as a food source or habitat, the more likely it is to be a keystone species. And so a takeaway uh, tip here is that when you plant multiple keystone species, then you provide high functional redundancy to provide to protect ecosystem stability. That just means you have redund a redundant system. So if you lose one, if you have others that can take over um, various roles and kind of hold things together, um, that, that's a good thing. And that's what happens when you have multiple uh, species that are keystones in your garden. What are some of those benefits of planting those native keystone species? They have amplified impact. Okay, keystone plant species have a disproportionate, disproportionate impact on the overall health and diversity of an ecosystem compared to their abundance. By planting them along with pioneer species, you jumpstart the development of a thriving habitat. So what this means 
by disproportionate impact is you only need a few to have a huge effect upon your um, upon your ecosystem. Um, another benefit is their adaptation. Many keystone plants are particularly well adapted to the local environment. Planting them with pioneers allows them to establish themselves quickly, creating a foundation and fostering conditions suitable for other native species to thrive. Another benefit is their connections. Keystone species act as connectors in the environment, creating a ripple effect of connections throughout the environment. They, they form a framework. They create living physical structures and niches that benefit a variety of plant, their plant and animal species. Time saving, saving, which we all love. By planting those high impact species with pioneers, you maximize the ecological benefit sooner. You quickly leverage their power to create a network of ready-made connections. They come with connections built in and very economical. You can achieve those maximum ecological benefits with limited resources and minimal effort and scalability. This concept can be applied to gardens of all sizes. You can even do this in a few pots of plants. You don't have to have a huge garden. You can literally plant uh, keystones and pioneers in pots if you don't have a yard. So oh, you're going, okay, so we're gonna plant keystones, we're gonna plant pioneers. How do I find what's gonna work? What's gonna work is what's local to your particular area. So the question then is, what are the native pioneer and keystone plant species that are local to a particular area? Luckily for us, there's a place you can find out. And that is Calscape, um, which is a database that is uh, done by the California Native Plant Society. It's calscape.org. It's an easy to use searchable database. There's lots of information and resources here, nursery resources. So you can literally go to nursery to find like what the nurseries are that have plants that you want. And you can create a plant palette to work with and they break it down for you. This is actually an old screenshot of their website. They've since updated it, but we have almost 8,000 plants, species native to California. That's a lot to choose from. So literally, you, if you can't find it in 8,000 species, it probably doesn't exist um, in terms of natives. But I so far have not run into an issue finding a plant to fulfill my very specific uh, aesthetic and functional needs and wants and desires. And they break it down for you into trees, shrubs, perennials, annuals, grasses, succulents, vines, ferns, plants that grow in the sun, plants that grow in the shade, part shade, ground covers, butterfly host plants. So like I said, lots and lots of great information here. Um, so that's how you can find what's local that grows in your area. So you can click, uh, you can type in your address and see what's really super local. And if you want to delve in, dive in deeper, you can go to the National Wildlife Federation's uh, plant, uh, the Keystone plant page. And this is just a screenshot of a couple of their, their pages here where they're showing the Mediterranean California Ecoregion 11, which breaks it down for you in terms of the top Keystone plant genera in Mediterranean California. And they break it down by trees, shrubs, and then herbaceous perennials. And, you know, they make it easy. And um, then they also talk to you about if you're interested in providing resources for butterflies and moth species, the top plants for those, as well as the top host plant for those uh, pollinators that are pollen specialists. They like specific tasty, pollen that they can only raise their young on. So they break it down super easily for you um, and by the genus, and then you can you can search for those plants. So um, that information exists, makes it easy to kind of break it down and find what you need. Some examples of plants that we have at our various pollinator gardens here, 
uh, at the Hopkins Garden, the anchor plant, uh, which is the keystone here, is the Quercus labata or the valley oak. And this, uh, this is a great, great tree here. See, we've got some Areogonum growing over here. There's poppies. So um, I use the same palette over and over again. Um, but the oaks, if you have the space to plant an oak tree, by all means, go for it. If you can't fit an oak tree into your space, they also come in a smaller size, the scrub oak, which is a small tree. And that can work in almost any yard size. They are, you know, they get maybe about 15 feet high. They grow super slowly. Um, you can prune them to shape. But the oaks here in the Santa Clara Valley, um, the, the valley oak used to be 61% of the tree cover. Now I think it's like around 1%. So anytime I have a chance to plant a valley oak, I do. And as a keystone species, they provide the critical support to the entire ecosystem. And the valley oak is deciduous, meaning that it drops all of its leaves at once, um, which you just leave them where they drop because that's the tree's fertilizer. They provide their own fertilizer and that supports the health of the tree. Their taproot, they have both a taproot that goes straight down and then lateral surface root. That taproot goes down to the groundwater and pumps the water up to the lateral roots, which then uh, spreads the water out and shares it with other plants. And underneath you can plant native plants like monardella, which is a nice smelling minty shrub. Um, and you want to plant native under oak trees because non-native plants can adversely affect the health of the tree. These plants are, these trees are insect factories, transforming that sunlight into protein uh, to feed countless birds and other species. They, and they grow quickly. They can live up to 600 years and they add value to real estate. So um, oak trees are a great example of a, a keystone species. Uh, my recommended species to start with, um, which they both, they cross over in both worlds. They are both, um, some of them are both keystone species as well as pioneer species. So the Arctostaphylus species, otherwise known as the Manzanita, the Ceanotha species, which is the blue blossom. I have some pictures of these coming up. Um, and they also fix nitrogen. Areogonum species that we talked about, the buckwheats, and then the Baccarus species, that coyote brush. Um, so great shrubs there. Trees, again, the uh, Quercus or oak species, maple species, and prunus. Okay, so oak, maple, and cherry. And because of the amplified effects of the keystone plant species, you can simply plant one of each and go from there and build from there. And this is what the Prunus alicifolia looks like in bloom. This is the uh, holly leaf cherry, look at that. It's just a, a beautiful, fluffy tree. And the ones that I have in my yard, I do not water at all. So, uh, super good in terms of water savings and water conservation. And uh, the birds love these trees, uh, pollinators love them, butterflies hang out on them. They're great, they're great trees. Um, some other uh, things to try in the keystone as well as the pioneer species, Ceanothus. Ceanothus comes into so many different forms and this is a form that's a ground cover Ceanothus horizontalis, Yankee Point, evergreen, which means it stays green all year, has a nice glossy leaf, so it looks nice and juicy. It's about 15 inches tall and it spreads. Beautiful blue blossoms in the spring, and winter and spring, can grow in sun or shade. And ground covers can aid in early ecosystem establishment. So this particular ground cover is helping to uh, shade and cool the soil. So you could literally plant inside of the ground cover, just make a little spot there and plant inside that. And that will help your, uh, maybe your tree or larger shrub to establish. So that's a nice lawn alternative. Another uh, Ceanothus that we use, one of my absolute favorites is Ceanothus maritima, valley violet. And I do like to use the scientific names, both the first thing, 
the genus and the species um, and then the variety because then you know exactly what you're getting. So this has a beautiful blue blossom in the winter and spring and um, larval host for dozens of butterfly and moth species, super low water use, beautiful shrub. And here's a, an Arctostaphylus, one of my absolute favorites. This is Arctostaphylus densiflora, Howard McMinn. Evergreen leaves, white blooms in January. And they support uh, 78 caterpillar species, 13 pollen specialist bees, and they also provide berries, nectar, and shelter for many other organisms. Um, why not throw in something new here? Uh, this is Ribes malvaceum, and Ribes are basically the gooseberry or currant. Uh, and this particular one is at the Hopkins Garden. Um, it's a variety called Christy Ridge. And in December and January, it puts on a show of these pink flowers. Incredible. And it goes on for like two months. So you really get a lot of bang for your buck out of this, uh, this plant here. Super low water use. It does lose most of its leaves all at once, but then it leaves out really fast. So it doesn't stay um, leafless too long. Um, and it's a host to three confirmed and 76 likely species of butterflies and moths. So again, all these connections, but what a beautiful, what a beautiful uh, pink uh, display. Just, I, I just love the color pink. So I plant a lot of pink things. Um, but for plant selection strategies, so I showed you the plants I like to use because um, for me, uh, they fulfill a lot of the functions that I want them to fulfill in terms of habitat and water saving and ease of care, because I do have eight gardens. I think it's eight gardens, which includes that quarter project to take care of. And that's a lot. So I don't want to be like fussing over things. And so these are very unfussy plants. So what are the functions that, but what do you need? And so these are questions to ask yourself. Do you, need, do you need shade? Do you need to screen out a view? Um, do you need a windbreak? Do you need a ground cover? Do you need an accent, something to like really um, be spectacular? So these are all aesthetic questions and functional questions to ask yourself. What are the attributes that you're looking for? Are they low water using, hopefully? Are they money saving? Um, are they low maintenance? This is, this is one of my main things. Do they live a long time? Uh, do they smell good? Uh, do they have a nice color? Do they have form, texture? You know, what appeals to you? You know, what color, do you like dark greens? Do you like light greens? Do you like gray greens? You know, and these are only questions that you can, that you can answer. Um, but there is a native plant that will fulfill all of your wishes. And so we're, because we are talking about the water savings, you can find out how much water plants use. And as it turns out, there is a website where you can look up specific species and you can look at how much water that particular plant uses as a percentage of what a lawn would use. Okay, and this is what's called the water use classification of landscape species. And it's an online searchable database. People call it Wuckles. I think that sounds weird, but anyway. And so plants then are ranked based on the percent of water use of turf grass, which is the reference against which all other water use is measured. So turf grass is considered 100%. And then the plant factor is basically a percentage. So very low is zero to 10% of what a lawn would use, 20 to 30%, 40 to 60%, and 70 to 100%. So you can find out if you want super low water use, um, this is the website that you uh, can use that will tell you that. Um, and so I mentioned that I have trees, lots of trees in my yard. These are some of my favorites and I, I've actually planted some more trees, but these are just the dozen that are already in my yard. Um, and so I have the big leaf maple, Acer macrophyllum. This is such a nice, nice, beautiful, um, just, I don't know, it has a very residential look to it. 
um, a smaller tree, the mountain mahogany, Cercocarpus betuloides. It doesn't drop all of its leaves, it's semi-deciduous, um, but mostly evergreen. Very great small tree. Um, I even have a, a willow, believe it or not. And I water things by hand. I don't. I haven't turned on my irrigation for a few years. Um, and so I, I will water things by hand. Um, Sambucus nigra, the elderberry, um, Prunus elicifolia, again. You can see, look at the, how glossy those leaves are. They're just shining in the sun. The box elder, another maple, Acer negundo. Uh, our street tree, which is Modesto ash, Coralis cornuta. So if you like hazelnuts, um, this is a, a great little shrubby tree. Um, another a cherry, a prunus virginiana. So this is actually deciduous, so not like the evergreen holly leaf cherry. This actually loses its leaf. And then Arctostaphylus glauca. So Arctostaphylus comes in many different forms. And this, uh, the big berry manzanita, this is an old picture that I have of it uh, from a couple of years ago. I think that it's been in the ground for maybe four years now. And it's now this year taller than me. And it's putting on probably four feet of growth this year. So once it's established, these things just shoot up. Um, Circus occidentalis, the red bud. And the red bud is actually a nitrogen fixer. So yet another one. You see, I have it underneath a cage here uh, to keep the squirrels from digging it up. And then our native toyon, Heteromelis arbutifolia. I don't water this at all. So super low water use. Um, so lots of great trees to try. Um, you know, and again, it depends on what you like. And I can't tell you what to plant. I can only show you things that I have that work for me um, in terms of low water use. They're not fussy um, and they've lived. And I am like the world's laziest caretaker of plants. So if something doesn't live, that's on, that's on the plant, it's not on me. Some shrubs, if you like that uh, lush appearance that doesn't look dry and desiccated, um, here's a few wonderful shrubs to try. And if you like to have that green lush looking uh, look in your yard, aim for about 75% of your yard to be evergreen shrubs that have a glossy dark green leaf. And some of the plants that do that, um, this is a plant, Vaccinium ovatium, our native huckleberry, uh, coffee berry, Frangula californica. Look at how glossy that leaf is there. Just, just so lovely. Prunus again, the heteromeles, the toyon, um, an Arctostaphylus, which comes as a ground cover. Like I said, the Arctostaphylus, those manzanitas come in a lot of different forms, ground covers, trees, and shrubs. And then another one of these gooseberries, Ribes viburnifolium. This particular one doesn't lose its leaf. And it, it, people like the way it smells. I'm not so excited about the, the fragrance of it, but um, it is green and, and lush. So, and these are all plants that I have in my own yard. I like it to look, um, I like it to look chunky and lush in my yard. Um, again, Vaccinium ovatum. Um, Pretty low water use. It's evergreen with white flowers here in February. And then uh, they turn into these edible blueberries that are so tasty and super, super intense blueberry flavor. Likely larval host to over 50 species of moths and butterfly makes a great upright hedge. And if you want them to grow faster, and this is the only native that I fertilize with cotton seed meal. They love this stuff for some reason. Um, but just a great shrub. Okay, so we've, we've talked about pioneers and keystones. We've looked at some examples. Let's look at the essential function of plants. Plants are nature's transformers of starlight into life's tapestry. Native plants fueled by the starlight transform this simple energy from the sun into the complex web of light, and they create order and beauty. So plants are the primary producers of food 
and the basis of the food web. So we have energy from the sun that is converted by plants into food that is then eaten by insects. And that then, those insects then are eaten by baby birds. And 37% of animal species are plant eating insects. And as a rule, native insects only eat the native plants they evolved with. Thus, <laughs> native plants efficiently channel that sun's energy into the food web in ways that non-native plants cannot. So here's a handy, here's a handy animation. Do, do, do. Do, do, do. And that's how it gets into the food web. So plants aren't decorations, plants are food. This is one of the essential functions of plants. What that means is that the native plants will, not maybe, it will attract many native pollinators, other insects, birds, and other organisms. Among other things, keystone plants provide food for many more species than do other plants. So when I talked about, you know, 78 species of moths and butterflies chowing down on a particular plant, that is what makes that plant a particular uh, into a keystone uh, type. And so here I have one of our, our native mallows here. And you see how holy this leaf is? That's because this will turn into a butterfly later on. Uh, and that I think is one of the uh, skipper butterflies. But when I go to the nursery, I look for plants that have holes in the leaves because chances are I've got some larva and I will be bringing home some butterflies with me. So I know a lot, this is like, people are like, what, this is blowing my mind. I like a clean, good looking plant, but there's so much more than just perfect leaves. There's this whole web of life. And so what's the implication of native plants as food? And because these native plants will attract a variety of native pollinators and other insects, using best practices will help them to complete their life cycles so that you'll see these beautiful bumblebees and these beautiful butterflies. You want that to happen. You want to let that happen. And so the great thing about a native plant garden, and because I really like low maintenance, low maintenance, oops, low maintenance sorts of things, um, I, ah, sorry about that. Um, trying to move my picture here. Um, I try to, to minimize the amount of work that I, I do in the gardens because it's work and I don't have time for like endless work. And so basically once the plants are in there and established, my main thing that I do to maintain these gardens is weed. And that even decreases over time. Um, when you first plant things during the planting season, which is during the fall and winter when the ground is moist and cool and wet from the rain, um, you wanna make sure that the plants are irrigated about once a week um, for the first year or so. Uh, the irrigation should encourage those roots to search for water and they will go quite a ways. So you can water deeply just outside the root ball when you're establishing them. You wanna prune sparingly and to control dried up dead material for fire safety and keep things off of pathways. But I like to leave the seed heads of plants for as long as possible because the birds eat the seeds. And so I will leave seed heads on plants, not for a few months, but for a couple of years. I'm just that lazy and the birds appreciate it so much. And I don't fertilize except for the cotton seed meal for the huckleberries. I amend very sparingly. When we first plant, we mulch to control weeds initially. And that, help to, that, that helps to establish the plants because that keeps the soil nice and cool and moist. And then basically I let leaves just fall where they may and um, use those as mulch, which is like the best thing ever because it's free. Some people, if you don't like the way that looks, you can like layer a thin coating of bark chips on the top to give it that uniform look, which I do occasionally because I think it just gives a nice intentional look to a garden. Um, 
But I also do leave areas of bare dirt for pollinators or native bees to nest underground because 70% of those pollinators actually are ground nesters. And I don't use leaf blowers in planted areas um, because once those leaves drop down, that's habitat for larva and butterfly pupas and all those other insects that are trying to you know, complete their life cycles. And it should uh, go without saying that we don't use pesticides, herbicides, or fungicides. They're just not necessary when you have a, a good mix of, of plants because everything will balance out in terms of predatory beneficial insects. Um, as a side note, I have a couple of apple trees in my backyard and over the course of years, the more native plants that I've incorporated, the less worms that I find in those apples. And I've tried everything to keep the worms out. I was bagging individual apples. The squirrels would rip the bags off, you know, work, right? Native plants have brought in just the right amount of predators that I actually have apples that don't have worms in them, like for the first time ever. So, um, bonus. <laughs> um, so some basics of plant layout, if you want to get the spacing correct, what I like to do when I'm designing um, or telling other people to design is, you know, measure your area. You know, if you have like, this is an example, if you had an area uh, 12 feet by 12 feet, use, use graph paper because each square on the graph paper can equal one foot. And that way you can um, plan things out. First, first, draw in the structure of where your pathways are going to go. And then after you've researched what plants you want, draw those plants at their mature diameter. Okay. And uh, most of those circles should just touch or overlap. And that's a good place to start with. But you can keep continually add in more and more plants over time. But this is a great start. Okay, so that's that's a very basic plant layout um, that you can that you can use. Um, and remember, uh, many of these insects. Remember these these plants are going to get used because they're food, and you know everything eats. So many insects spend a lot of time as an egg or a larva, months or years, and many of these larvae overwinter inside stems or leaf litter. That's why I don't prune things too short because in that last foot or so, if there's a hollow stem, uh, insects will lay eggs on top of each other. They'll stack them up inside of a hollow stem. So I just leave the leaves. I don't prune, um, you know, because months or years can go by while these uh, creatures are in their larval state. The adult lifespan of many insects is super short, just long enough to reproduce. So this is this is a lengthy time for, for many insects. Um, and because you're using native plants that are super efficient users of water, um, the ones that are drought tolerant or use very little water, um, they store water inside their tissues. And then those insects get that moisture from those plants. And so you have basically plants and animals storing water in their living tissues and then moving it through the environment using various processes. So I call this the biological water pump, which, you know, the water, the free water that exists in living tissue is a small fraction of the free water on the planet, but it's doing what water is intended to do, supporting life. So even if it's a small amount, it's super, super important. And again, the dynamic nature of these gardens. Remember, um, nature doesn't stay still. Native plant gardens are dynamic. Relationships between plants, the plants themselves, organisms that use the plants, their caretakers, that's you and me, uh, and the overall structure of a garden changes over time. So, um, you know, gardens are never one and done. I continuously add plants and People say, how do you have space? And it's like, there's always space. Um, surprisingly, there's always space. Um, 
And what I mean by that, um, think of building a house. The pioneer plants lay the groundwork, like preparing the site and the foundation. Keystone plants are like the strong walls holding the structure together. And then come the other plants and animals, the floors, doors, and windows, creating a vibrant living home. And so you can start adding in things like, uh, we have so many native bulbs. This is Brodea californica. The pink form, surprise, surprise, look how beautiful these are. I absolutely love bulbs. Um, why plant daffodils when you can have native plants that are just like perfectly adapted to create all this life and this beauty? And um, this beauty uh, happens over time. It unfolds over time. And among the wonderful things things provided when you plant native is that you are providing the opportunities and the resources for organisms to complete their life cycles, to be born, to feed, to mate, to lay eggs, and then to be recycled, okay? And you want to allow the time for these biological processes to take place because that's what native plants do is they, they make this possible. They make all this beauty possible. And some final thoughts. By understanding the role of pioneer species in laying the groundwork and keystone species in providing structure, you can unlock the full potential of your native plant garden, fostering an abundance of life and fulfilling your role as a steward of nature's intricate beauty. And with that, I would be happy to take some questions. I don't see any takers. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, uh, my work here is done. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? Questions? Just raise your hand. And I can unmute you if you don't want to type something in the in the questions. In the Q&A. Well, I would also like to mention that I'm always looking for volunteers. And volunteers get goodies like free plants and seeds because <laughs> these gardens are super abundant. I always have seedlings and seeds more than I know what to do with actually, which is why the gardens keep growing in size. Oh, there's a question. We do have one, yay. So um, she says, in case we are getting started with the lawn replacement, would we first wait for the pioneers to establish before planting other species? Plant them together. Okay. Yeah. She's asking this in the context of planting during the fall. Right. Um, plant everything together um, and they will help each other uh, be very successful in establishing. Any more questions? Yeah, planting the, the two types of plants together, um, it's like it's like supercharging uh, your establishment of plants. And, um, you know, it just, I'm always looking for ways to make things easier and do, to do less work. And this is one of the, the big secrets that I've stumbled across. So I'm happy to share the benefits of the last eight years of doing these public gardens and learning everything about native plants that I possibly can. Um, and the, this is one of the key lessons that I've learned in that time um, is that these two things, it's literally like magic, how they help each other. Anyone else? Was that the end? Raise hand. Raise hand. Let's see. Oh, here we go. <clears throat> we have several Al Manzanitas. 
Oh, so oh, sorry, it was separated. We have several manzanita trees and shrubs in our garden. We don't, uh, they don't look very happy. Do they require any special care? Um, they shouldn't require um, any special care. One thing to check to see is, you know, are they uh, close to anything that's getting watered, especially during the summertime? Um, that could be an issue. They do like a good layer of leaf litter underneath. That keeps their roots pretty happy. Um, the roots on a manzanita do spread laterally quite a distance. And so, um, you know, there may be things around them that um, they're interacting with, you know, without seeing the actual site, uh, it's hard to know exactly for sure. Um, but I, I don't water my uh, Arctostaphylus at all, um, but I do make sure that they do have a nice uh, thick, chunky layer of leaves underneath. Scrub oak, same cap characteristics. I do believe a scrub oak has uh, the same tap root and lateral roots. Uh, how much width in the garden to accommodate a valley oak? Um, you know, so that's a very good question. Um, at the Hopkins Garden, we have a valley oak um, in a space that I'm thinking is probably about 20 feet wide. Um, and it's doing great. We also have a scrub oak um, that is in a space that's about five feet across. So a scrub oak, even though they're pretty slow, um, would, would work in a space of about five feet uh, across, say, between a sidewalk and a fence if you had like a planting bed. Um, now at the Gwenda Street Garden, we have um, a street tree in there, uh, which is, it's a, the, the Gwenda Street Garden is a traffic island that's kind of shaped like a piece of pizza. And at the pointy end is where this huge, like 300 year old, it's really old valley of growing there. And it's growing in a space of about maybe 15 feet wide, uh, but there are two streets on either side of it. So it has a huge canopy. And so when planting things like these big oak trees, you want to keep them uh, about 20 feet away from the foundation of your house because the canopy indicates where the roots are going and you don't want the roots to interfere with your foundation and you don't want branches to drop on top of your house. Um, so, you know, you want, to, you want to keep it about 20 feet away from your house. So if you have space for it, that's great. Um, if not, then I would definitely recommend um, a scrub oak of some kind. Any more questions? I have a question yes, about, the, about the ribes that you showed. I've only seen the ribes um, growing in the wild along riparian um, corridors. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a creek or there's, there's some sort of water source nearby. Is that normal for ribes to, or are there varieties that will grow um, without a lot of water nearby. Yes, there there's definitely a range of different um, water needs amongst the ribes. Um, there are some that do grow nicely in chaparral. Uh, my experience with the ribes is that they do like a little shade in the afternoon. Um, and shade is one of those things to uh, really encourage in your garden to uh, hold down water loss because the evaporation isn't as great as if something's in the full sun, which is why I always tell people plant some trees because um, uh, trees save water. Um, but yeah, so there's a range of water uses amongst the ribes, some more than others, certainly. Um, in, our, in our public gardens, there is irrigation. Um, but not a lot. I, I, we like maybe turn the, the irrigation on once a week for about 10 minutes to kind of dust everything off. And that's all they get. Um, in other places, 
Um, there is no irrigation on some of the corridor project. Um, so yeah, it, uh, um, you know, it, it just varies. I would look to see which is the lower uh, water use amongst the ribes to see which would work in, in, in for like a drier situation versus something maybe a little moister and shadier. Uh, how far away from the foundation should prunus be planted? Um, you know, I like to maintain um, a few feet away from foundations just in general um, with trees because trees fall over. Um, and, um, you, I, you know, I think a tree likes to be able to like expand its branches symmetrically all around. And if you put something that's like three feet away from a, a house, then you're going to get stubby branches on one side. So I would, I would try to keep a, a prunus about seven or eight feet away from the, um, uh, from the foundation of a house. A good way to know uh, how far the roots are gonna go is to look at the mature diameter of a plant and then to go in the radius to see where the center is will give you how far away things should be from the house. And, and that's just a kind of a good rule of thumb. That way you have a nice symmetrical uh, shape unless you want to, you know, do the work of pruning things into a form, um, you know, but again, it's it's your own aesthetic preference. I prefer to keep trees a little further away from um, the foundation. It just is easier for the tree and for maintenance purposes. Okay. You know, I could see that there was, uh, it looked like there was someone by the name of Carol who was raising their hand, but I can't seem to get to a place to unmute someone. So. Oh, we have another question. So regarding planting and propagation, any tips on propagation via cuttings and also seeds, plant directly versus uh, containers first? Ah, yes. Well, so um, I grow a lot of things from seed uh, just because I, I appreciate the genetic diversity and I like to see what happens, like how long seeds take to germinate. Uh, when you propagate things via cuttings, then you're ending up with a lot of clones and that can be problematic. Um, seeds, you have a lot of genetic diversity. So what I like to do with seeds is I do uh, the cold moist stratification. That sounds really scientific and hard, but basically it's just taking a coffee filter, wetting it down, putting the seeds inside of it, putting that into a plastic baggie, sealing it up and sticking it in the fridge, and then seeing how long it takes for those seeds to germinate. And once they show a root tip coming out, then I pot them up. Um, otherwise, you know, some seeds take months to germinate. <laughs> some seeds I started back in February still have not germinated. And, um, you know, seeds, some seeds take their time. If you're interested in getting plants very quickly, um, you know, I, and I, I've done cuttings of things too, because I like to propagate very quickly. Um, you know, it depends on, you know, if there's a plant that you really like and you want more of it for your garden, you buy one and you take cuttings and then you have more of that particular plant. Um, so there's, there are good reasons not to take, to do cuttings um, just because of the clone issue. Um, and there's good reasons to also do cuttings because it's faster, um, you know, like, do you want to wait 10 years before something flowers? You know, I mean, I'm 64 years old, I do the math. <laughs> so it's like, okay, the seeds I started for bulbs three years ago should be ready before I'm 70 uh, for blooms. So, you know, it's a matter, 
I think, a personal preference. But if you can grow things from seed, that would be my go-to. It's also cheaper, I think. Because <laughs> in a seed packet, you can get like 500 seeds. Exactly. And, you know, and, um, you know, but then again, you pot those up and then they have to take care of them. It's a, it's a process. And I'm guilty of starting way more seeds than I can ever use. But... <laughs> <laughs> My my obsession never ends. It's just like, okay, Juanita, really? Just like calm it down. That's okay. You can share. I do share. And like <laughs> I said, volunteers get free goodies. There you go. All right. Any oh, we have more. And one garden successfully without irrigation systems. Can I really yes. succeed with hand watering only? Yep. <laughs> I only hand water my garden at here at home and it's doing just fine. I mean, and I'm not even very consistent about it if I remember to water. Um, but yes, it's absolutely possible for things to succeed without an irrigation system. Um, in fact, I actually broke our irrigation system because when I was digging, I broke some pipes and then our controller stopped working. And it, you know, squirrels would dig through and chew up the, and I finally was like, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to water by hand. And I have a pretty good thick layer of leaf litter in my garden. Um, I have the some of the native uh, fungus that forms associations with the roots of plants that help them to, to thrive. Um, and I water maybe... Uh, I don't know, maybe once a week, you know, um, some things don't get watered at all. I have a lot of things in pots that I water by hand, um, wetland species growing in pots, um, you know, um, which are, which are kind of fun to grow. Um, so, and, you know, I looked at our water bill for this last month and it was actually less than last year. And I've got all these wetland species in pots. So, you know, I must be doing something correct. And everything is, is still alive. Um, like I said, the prunus doesn't get watered. The arctostaphylus doesn't get watered. Um, the toyon doesn't get watered. Um, the, the, the grasses, I have native grasses in our uh, front lawn area. Don't water those at all. Um, yeah, so it is it is actually possible to just do it by hand watering. If your yard is of a manageable size and you have those species that can just like, you know, are just fine without water. So if you have an acre, you know, it might take a little bit more planning, but I think it could probably be done. So this is like a standard city lot then that mm -hmm. you're talking about that you water by hand. Yes, where I live. It, our, our lot is 6,000 square feet. It's very small. There's a large patio on one side. Um, the front yard is very small. The backyard is maybe 20 feet deep at most. Um, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty dinky. Most of the garden beds are um, in between the patio and the fence. There's like a three foot space. The front yard, it's a regular front yard with a driveway and everything. Um, Part of the corridor project that we planted last November, um, we planted in Baccarus, Arctostaphylus, Ariogonum, uh, a few other things. And in all of that time from last year, I've watered that once. And last time I checked, everything was still alive. So it can, it can get done. You know, I, I try to select those plants that it's on them and not on me. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the back rest, you know, that's going to go in every garden because it just is like magic. Uh, Arctostaphylus is going to go into every garden. Um, and those, those plants help other plants. Um, the Ceanothus grows really well by itself. Um, Artemisia is, you know, 
one of those plants that that can grow without any sort of uh, watering. Um, I forget all that we planted in that in that section. Um, one of my tricks along the section of the quarter project, which is between the sidewalk and the street, there's a strip nine feet wide that goes from almost a quarter mile. So it's a lot of land um, is to use the area next to the curb because the curb is where a lot of water collects because it's a barrier. Mm -hmm. And so anything that needs a little bit more moisture gets put in along the curb. Um, and then we, we mulched it first with um, a layer of um, basic bark, uh, like, like just, uh, what was that? It was the premium arbor mulch from Lingso. And then on top of that, um, we put that very nice small fur bark mulch to make it look more decorative and to make it look intentional so that it looks like somebody's taking care of it. Um, and so far, everything is, is still alive. I experiment a lot to see who wants to live and who doesn't want to live. And um, <laughs> I should laugh like that. But um, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, um, you know, sink or swim gardening for these plants. And these are the species that I find are super hardy. The buckwheats, the, um, the coyote brush, um, the uh, Arctostaphylus, really easy. Sounds like my kind of gardening. All right. Well, it is 742. We do have more time um, if we have any more questions. Otherwise, I think we'll call it a night. So anyone else? Well, I do appreciate that the chance to share my gardening secrets. And uh, I would encourage people to uh, come out to Palo Alto and have a look. Um, it's, you know, there's always something to see. Um, you know, if you're looking to volunteer, that's also um, a, a great way to uh, learn more about native plants. I generally have a work day once a week for the gardens because, you know, we're going into planting season um, and so I have lots of things to plant still. And, um, you know, there's always a little bit of weeding to do. So yeah, um, feel free to, to reach out if you're interested. Um, and uh, pointers for volunteer opportunities. Yes. So um, you can message me through the Primrose Way Pollinator Garden site. There's a contact form that you can fill out. And uh, I will happily add you to the uh, to the volunteer email list because I email volunteers and say, okay, Saturday at 10 o'clock, we're gonna be at this garden or that garden. And um, yeah, it's uh, you know always looking for people who wanna get in there and have some fun. And what was the name of it again? The Primrose Way Pollinator Garden.com. So on the, the first slide, um, if I can pull it back up. Um, let me go here. Uh, oops. All right. Yeah. Slide from beginning. Oh, and you're on Facebook too. Yes. So Facebook is a great way to get uh, in contact. Instagram. Um, the Primrose Way Pollinator Garden .com does have a uh, contact uh, form in there, but you can message me through uh, Facebook and Instagram at Primrose Way Pollinator Garden. Um, I try to post as often as possible. For me, uh, it's a it's a great way to use social media. It also helps me keep track of what's going on. I can like scroll back through and go, oh yeah, that's when that was blooming, or that's when those butterflies come out. And so it helps me. It's kind of like a little uh, public diary for me. Um, but yes, uh, let me know. And uh, happy to bring people on board. And yes, the slides will be shared. Yes, I, I will create a PDF version of this that I'll send to Debbie. And, um, you can uh, 
you know, read it at your leisure. <laughs> Sounds good. And then there's also the um, Going Native tour as well. The Going Native Garden tour. Yes. Oh, so I'm not, yes. I'm not actually going to be on that tour this year, but they do have, um, you know, different people's homes that you can see. People, Native gardeners sign up for that, that the CNPS uh, puts on. That's uh, really good. Um, October 5th, I believe, is another event um, done by the uh, Arts Center um, here in Palo Alto uh, at the Rinconada um, Park. Yes, um, and that will be in the afternoon at the Arts Center in which um, we are going to do a progressive walking tour from the Arts Center where there's a native garden um, on the parkland there. And then the Hopkins Garden is across the street from that. And then from there, we'll walk down the corridor and there'll be a reception and told at the Gamble Garden. So that's an event that's coming up October 5th, which is a Saturday. I believe it's in the afternoon if you go to the the Palo Alto website for the uh, Palo Alto Arts Center. Uh, there's more information about that. Um, so lots of opportunities to uh, see these plants up close and personal and to, you know, see what we're doing here in town. Yeah, the California Native Plant Society, um, they do a great job of hosting the Native Garden Tour. I've gone a few times and it's just really fun to see what people have done um, and you get to see it you know in your standard residential home so you can kind of you can kind of see the size of things and um, what they're going to look like some some are newly planted gardens some are fully mature gardens so they're really great tours I agree. We, we did it one year for the primrose way garden um, and it was, it was really, really fun. We also do, um, an Earth Day event, um, and I usually do that in conjunction with the library over at the Rinconada Park, um, in which, uh, there's a, a walk, a self-guided walking tour of the various gardens, um, and that's, that's always a fun one as well. Okay. Well... I think it's going, going, gone. Okay. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much. And and um, go to the Bosco website and check out all of the other um, classes that are being offered. Some are in person. Some are webinars like this. And, um, and enjoy because we've got great instructors like Juanita. So, and lots of topics. All right. Well, I hope to see some of you back here on the TED. All right. Have a good night, everyone. And thank you, Anita. Thank you, Debbie. Really, really enjoyed it. Great. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.